I am thrilled to introduce today's speaker, Dominic Torno. Dominic is a principal engineer and on the DevRel team here at Temporal. He focuses on systems modeling, specifically conceptual and formal modeling, to support the design and documentation of complex software systems. Dominic has a fantastic presentation prepared for you all, and I'm so excited that you're here to join the conversation. So once again, ask questions if you have them, it makes the conversation even more fun for us. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Dominic. Good morning. Thanks, Kelly. All right. Let's see if I set this up right. Okay, if you can, let me know if you can see the screen well, and then we can take it from there. Looks great. All right. So good morning, everybody. Um, today, we are talking about sagas. And I am sure everybody on this call, everybody has heard about sagas before. And everybody on this call has some idea of what sagas are and what sagas do and how sagas work. But however, there are many different mental models, many different mental models of sagas. Some are slightly different and some are actually contradictory. And um, I will present one very specific mental model, my mental model, but I cannot claim that I am right or that you are wrong, right? So my mental model is not canonical and it's not authoritative. However, I spend a lot of time and effort to ensure that the mental model that I present today is in itself consistent so that you are able to extract some valuable information from it. And I also collected some blog posts and uh, some papers that I like that I will reference throughout the presentation. And I will share all of the links at the end of the presentation. If you want to, uh, if you want to dive a little deeper and study sagas uh, on your own time as well. So to me, sagas are a member of the set of the most elusive concepts in software engineering period. For the longest time, I didn't feel that I have a solid, confident understanding of sagas. Yeah, there is an entire ecosystem of thought leaders and influencers cranking out polished blog posts and videos about domain-driven design and event sourcing and CQRS and event-driven architecture, and choreography, and orchestration, and of course, sagas and compensation, and I'm sure I forgot a bunch of stuff. And trying to understand sagas is a bit like trying to reach the end of a rainbow. You can see it in the distance, but you just cannot get there. And the rainbow shines in bright colors. The colors of scalability, and the colors of reliability, and the colors of loose coupling. Yeah. So if you can't get to the rainbow, you are seriously missing out. So for the longest time, I didn't really know what sagas were, but I just knew that I really needed them for the possible best architecture. So, well, of course, in one webinar, we cannot explore how the best architecture for your application may look like, but we can have a measured, deliberate, and focused look at sagas so we can all effectively and efficiently decide if sagas are for us. The first observation is that the term saga yeah, denotes both a concept and all possible implementations of that concept. So that alone makes talking about sagas unnecessarily confusing right off the bat. I like the term long running process yeah, to refer to the concept and the term saga to refer to an implementation. Yeah. And in this presentation, we will look at both the concept and a bit at the implementation, but we will heavily, heavily focus on the concept itself. Now, I will also slip up and say saga sometimes um, talking about the concept, sometimes talking about the implementation. 
because it is just so prevalent. So if at any time you want to remind yourself, if you're talking about the concept or the implementation, please take a look at the top and the bottom of the presentation. And the bold font will indicate where we are. So the concept of sagas was first introduced by Garcia Molina and Salem in the paper Sagas from 1987. And sagas are motivated by one simple observation. The sequential composition of two transactions is itself not a transaction. But transactions have many desirable properties and they're typically referred to as acid. Short for atomicity, consistency, isolation, and uh, durability. They're almost synonymous with the database world. So the classic example, which is also used in the original paper is travel booking. The traveler wants to book a hotel and a flight. But if either the hotel or the flight is not available, the traveler doesn't want to book either. Yeah, we have this all or nothing idea. But again, the sequential composition of these transactions is itself not a transaction. We do not enjoy asset guarantees. We do not enjoy all or nothing guarantees just out of the box. So this is where Garcia, Molina, and Salem propose the concept of sagas, which they characterize as a long-running transaction. The purpose of sagas is to provide transaction-like guarantees for a sequential composition of transactions. So sagas are able to guarantee atomicity, consistency, and durability. However, we do have to sacrifice isolation. The term long running transaction highlights the author's focus on the world of databases and on the world of transactions. But since then, since 1987, microservices have replaced databases as a domain of discourse. So now we generally characterize sagas not as long running transactions, but as long running processes. However, the term itself, long running, yeah, can also be misleading because we are actually not talking long running in terms of physical time. A long running process may actually execute just for mere microseconds, but it can execute for many years. The way to think about this is that a process is a sequence of steps. And just by definition, I postulate a short running process consists of one step and a long running process consists of multiple steps. So the notion of short running and long running refers to logical time on a logical clock, not physical time on a physical clock. So with this information, I think we are at a good spot where we can accurately and concisely define the concept of a saga. A saga is a long running process. That is, a saga is a sequence of steps where any partial execution is undesirable. So the sequence of steps is correct if and only if all of them are executed or none of them are executed. But how do we make this a reality? Yeah. How do we get there? For that, we need to explore two concepts that are vital for uh, sagas on a conceptual level that are vital to guarantee these transaction-like properties, continuations and compensations. So recall that a saga is a sequence of steps and any partial execution is undesirable. So in order to guarantee all or nothing, it's often called effectively once semantics, we need to 
carefully manage the continuation of a saga that is the current state of the execution to be able to guarantee forward recovery or forward progress in the presence of a failure. So continuation is really just an elegant word to say the current state of the process mid-execution. That capability is often referred to as restartability or retriability of a saga. And we also need to carefully manage the current compensation. That is a sequence of steps to undo what we have done so far to be able to guarantee backward recovery in the presence of failure. And that capability is often refer referred to as abortability of a saga. So we need to track the continuation to be able to guarantee forward recovery. And we need to track the compensation to be able to guarantee backward recovery. Okay, cool. But when do we choose forward recovery and when do we choose backward recovery? Forward recovery is more desirable. Yeah, we drive the process to completion. We generate business value. Yeah? I am selling a hotel room and I am selling a ticket. Backward recovery is less desirable. We do not generate business value. No hotel room sold, no ticket sold. However, we at least leave the system in a correct state. So we prefer forward um, recovery where possible and resort to backward recovery when necessary. And it turns out there are two types of scenarios based on two types of failures and the two types of mitigation strategies. There are platform level failures and application level failures. In our example, a platform level failure of the hotel booking step could be a crash or a could not connect exception. Yeah? Generally something that's transient or intermittent that just repairs itself, goes away on its own. Yeah? And since we expect the failure to repair itself, we attempt forward recovery. So we just restart, we retry, we execute the continuation. An application level failure of the hotel booking step could be a no room available exception. And that's generally considered a permanent failure. It doesn't repair itself. And we're not just sitting there retrying until it becomes available. So since we don't expect that uh, failure to repair itself, we need to perform backward recovery. Yeah, we execute the compensation. However, one word of caution, I argue that in the case of platform level failure, we just attempt forward recovery. We retry and retry and retry. Well, everything in practice has limits, yeah? so we do not want to retry forever. Eventually, we have to stop. So if we exceed our retry budget, we elevate the uh, platform level failure to an application level failure, and then we perform backward recovery. So if you want to learn more about like the intricacies of platform level failures and application level failures, transient, intermittent, permanent failures, auto repair, manual repair, and an ideal failure handling strategy, then I uh, recommend my own blog post, yeah? Handling Failures from First uh, Principles. Okay, let's see how that works in quote unquote practice. While we follow the execution, we will build up a trace of the execution so we can reason about it. Yeah? The trace is the history of steps and their results that have been executed so far. And we also, for good measures, throw in any crash failures that we may uh, encounter. So at the beginning of the execution, the continuation consists of the steps of booking a hotel and booking the flight. The compensation and the trace are empty. We haven't done anything yet. Then after executing the step of booking the hotel, the continuation consists of the step of booking the fly, what's left. And the compensation consists of the step of canceling the hotel in case we need to go backwards. And the trace contains the information that we successfully booked uh, the hotel room. 
And then lastly, after executing the step to book the flight, the continuation is empty. And the compensation consists of the step to cancel the flight and cancel the hotel. And the trace contains information that we successfully booked the hotel, successfully booked uh, the uh, flight. And therefore, with that, we can um, terminate this execution successfully. So in general, sagas um, generate two types of execution, a desirable successful execution where uh, the saga executes every step and every step to completion. We just saw that one. Um, that is true even if we encounter a platform level failure due to forward recovery, right? still effectively once. However, a saga also produces the less desirable, the unsuccessful execution where the saga executes some steps, then it experiences an application level failure. Uh, and then we need to uh, execute the accumulated compensation to completion to undo what we have done. But there are pitfalls because there are always pitfalls. And these pitfalls are still independent of the implementation. We are still only talking about concepts. So, so far, we have implicitly assumed that executing a step and managing the persistent continuation and the persistent uh, compensation is atomic. Yeah? However, that is not the case. In rare cases, is that the case? And it's mostly never the case. So let's look at the very first step only. That step is in itself a careful crafted interleaving of three different steps. It's updating the compensation, then performing the step, then updating the continuation. So first we update the compensation. So we will not miss a compensating step in case of an untimely failure. Then we perform the actual step. Then we update the continuation so that we will not miss the actual step in case of an untimely failure. This interleaving ensures that we accurately record undos and redos, if you will. But now our system has to tolerate a lot of different traces. This is a trace of successful execution, no hiccups. However, if your system crashes after performing the actual step, but before updating the continuation, when the system restarts, you may see a step being executed multiple times. So therefore the effect on your system executing any step multiple times must be equivalent to the effect on your system executing every step exactly once. So in short, any step has to be idempotent. In fact, that's the very definition of idempotency. And of course, the same is true during compensation. If your system crashes after performing the compensating step, but before updating uh, the compensating continuation, then when the system restarts, you may see a compensating step being executed multiple times. So therefore, the effect on your system, executing any number of steps, any number of time, and then executing any number of compensating steps, any number of times must be equivalent uh, to the effect on your system of executing not at all. And that's quite a requirement. That is not at all easy to achieve and that is on you as a developer. And somewhat unexpected, yeah, I just wanna highlight that as a curiosity um, because when it dawned on me, I was actually a little surprised. If your system crashes after updating the compensation, when the system restarts and uh, performing a rollback, you may see a compensation executed multiple times without ever seeing the actual step being executed. So therefore the effect on your system executing a compensating step multiple times without ever performing the actual step must be equivalent to the effect on your system executing not at all. 
So in short, a compensation must be a no-op if the actual step was not performed. Again, on you as a developer. So that was certainly the most difficult uh, section of the webinar and hard to internalize in one go. So I highly, highly recommend Jim Gray's excellent, excellent paper, a transaction model from 1980. The paper is absolutely delightful. It's enlightening. It is uh, clearly and elegantly written and it details everything I have said in uh, this section. So after, after you study this paper, you will be a rock-solid Saga expert. Nothing is going to surprise you. And um, you will also be a rock-solid uh, transaction model expert. Again, no surprises. Okay. For the last few minutes, now that we have a strong foundation of the concept of a Saga, we can briefly turn to the implementations of Sagas. Briefly, briefly. And there are largely two approaches, orchestration and choreography. Now, the topic of orchestration and choreography both warrants its own, uh, um, that topic warrants its own webinar. So if you're interested in that, let me know in the chat and then we can uh, schedule a similar style webinar about only orchestration and uh, choreography in the future. But let's give a brief overview. Orchestration implies the existence of a dedicated, coordinate, uh, of a dedicated coordinator, yeah? centralizing the decision of the next step to take. So in pseudocode, you can see the control logic of your long running process is available all in one place. In contrast, choreography implies the absence of a dedicated coordinator. It's decentralizing decision of the next step to take. Now, for whatever reason, yeah, centralization carries a negative connotation and decentralization carries a positive connotation in our ecosystem. But uh, I, do not all, I do not agree in all cases, especially in this one. Uh, because here in pseudocode, you can already see that the control logic of your long running process is smeared across many places, some of which you may not even have access to. And that very much, very much reminds me of Leslie Lamport's quote that a distributed system is a system where a failure of a component that you didn't even know existed renders your own component unusable. So with this very brief overview of uh, the implementation, let's do a quick summary. Sagas can be confusing because the term saga alone is used for denoting both the concept and the implementation. So I prefer to think uh, in terms of the concept, in terms of long running processes, and when we talk about the implementation uh, in terms of sagas. Now, again, the concept is motivated by the simple observation that the sequential composition of um, two transactions is not itself a transaction. So the goal of sagas is to provide transaction-like guarantees for the sequential composition of transactions and in modern terms for the sequential composition of service calls. Mastering sagas requires you to master the concepts of continuation and compensation. You are responsible for this. Uh, um, uh, for this management. You are responsible for the correct interleaving and reasoning about um, the different possible interleavings. Traces, different possible traces. And you are also responsible to guarantee forward recovery and backward recovery, guarantee the correct execution, guarantee the retries. So there is a lot on uh, your plate. And the two... Um, main strategies to implement all of this, implement the retries, implement the forward and backward recovery, implement the guarantees to make forward uh, progress, backward progress. The two large strategies, one is orchestration-based with a central coordinator. One is, uh, one is uh, choreography-based uh, with no central uh, coordinator. I also want to recommend one more paper uh, by Pat Helen, Building on Quicksand. Um, that uh, talks about um, sagas in the broader concept. 
uh, or as a as a broader concept and also as a as a concept in the context of your applications what does good architecture with saga actually look like and uh with that uh thank you very much as a uh Reminder, as uh, Kelly already said, um, if you have any uh, questions, of course, A, uh, feel free to uh, ask them now in the Q&A. And then also, please do reach out to us. Uh, we are available on uh, multiple channels. However, I uh, suggest the Temporal uh, Slack channel where we uh, all hang out. And if you want to drive the com uh, conversation forward, uh, if you have uh, more questions, if you want to talk about distributed systems, or if you want to know how sagas and workflows actually compare, do reach out to me. And then we have a, a look at your specific application and uh, whether sagas or workflows would be right for you. And then thank you very much.